is a journey. Upon conception, each and every one of us was handed a set of genetic building blocks. And they're the only ones that we're ever going to get. And that creates our physical self, the baseline of our intellectual self, and influences our personality. God's gift is that we come into this world a bundle of spirit. And then we were given the family setting where our stories are to begin. Hi, I'm Claudia Black, and today I'm going to talk about the baggage that we've carried in this life. Some of us were blessed to grow up in well-functioning families, a loving, stable family, a family with financial stability and community support. Others of us did not have that experience. Life was more difficult, not so stable, not so safe. However we experienced those early years, though, we're all on this journey of life. And think of this journey as a trip. And the fact that when people go on a trip, most will have a destination in mind. They'll think of where they're going, how it is they're going to get there, and what it is that they're going to take with them. As a young person leaving the family in which we were raised, as we enter the adult world, all of us were given a map. Now, irrespective of gender, socioeconomic class, or ethnic identity, the most frequent destinations were school, marriage, work, or the military. Yet for some of us, there was no destination, simply an open door. And it was a door that we would walk through, not having any sense of direction. We might stumble into school, the military, marriage, or some type of work. But very often, we just hit the streets Destination unknown. As we made this journey, we all carried some sort of luggage. This baggage would carry with it our beliefs, our feelings, and our skills. While many of us have a similar map, or we end up on the same streets, the reality is our baggage, what we carry with us, is often different from each other. For some, it may be a brown paper bag that tears easily or maybe even disintegrates in the rain. Or it could be sturdy, hardback luggage. And for others, it could be more soft, medium size. That which shows itself to the world, the shell, is just that. It's an outside exterior. And that exterior will represent our defenses that we have built to protect, hide, and contain our beliefs, feelings, and skills. Whatever the exterior, though, the contents may be very similar to each other inside. The baggage that I'm talking about is our beliefs or attitudes that we've developed in our growing up or young adult years. The beliefs about ourselves, others, and the world. The feelings that we have accumulated, that we've held on to because it wasn't safe to express them and the skills that we developed that have helped us to live with others and to be able to achieve our goals. What I'm asking you to do today is to look at the bags that you travel with, unpack them, and look inside. What are you carrying? Beliefs, attitudes, feelings, relationships, behaviors? How long have you been carrying it? Who has packed the bags? And do these bags still serve their purpose? Now, what does that say about you? And is that the way that you still see yourself? The possibilities are many. Let's look at the bags that carry your beliefs about you and the world. Are you carrying beliefs that say, I'm strong, I'm capable. I deserve to be happy. I deserve respect. I can take care of myself. I can ask for help if I need it. People are trustworthy. I am trustworthy. It's okay to take risks. The world has lots of wonderful things to offer. Or does your bag more likely carry such beliefs as, you can't trust other people. They're just going to take advantage of you. 
Nobody's going to listen to me. You better take what you need in this world. The world's really a scary place. It's not okay to make a mistake. Something bad's going to happen. Good things only happen to other people. I don't expect too much from me. I'm inadequate and insufficient, and I can't seem to do anything right. I need someone to take care of me. If I show people who I am, they're not going to like me. The world owes me, and I'm entitled. What are the feelings that you carry with you? Do you carry memories of laughter, happy times, feeling good about yourself? Do you feel loved? Do you have so much fear in your life that you have one whole bag designated just for that? How much anger or how many resentments are you carrying? How large is your bag of hopelessness or your disappointments, your sadness or your guilt? And along with this is another important question to ask ourselves. Do we find ourselves carrying other people's bags such as your mother or your father's fears, their guilt, their shame? Do you take on your daughter or your son's disappointments or their angers? When our feelings are painful, we often rewrap them. If we're frightened of our anger, we may wrap it in tears, making it look like sadness. Or we may wrap our sadness with a smile, looking a lot more brave and confident than how we feel. We wrap them with a defense that feels more safe to us. But in between that outer layer, that outer wrapping, and our real feelings, we have this thin paper wrap of beliefs that tell us that it's not okay to feel or show our feelings. And those beliefs often come from our shame, which tells us that, again, we are inadequate, insufficient, bad, or maybe even damaged. What we fail to recognize is that in our luggage, most of us are carrying a tool bag, and that is a bag of skills. Now, do you have a variety of tools or a limited number? And what type? What are they? They could be the ability to ask for what you need, the ability to listen, problem-solving skills, the ability to see choices available, negotiation skills, the healthy expression of feelings. Do you have the ability to set limits? Clarity around what is important to you, the ability to make decisions, or self-care skills such as eating adequately in a healthy manner, cleanliness, basic hygiene skills, appropriate clothing, such as wearing a raincoat in the rain, and getting the proper rest, the sleep that you need, and exercise. But I would venture to guess that most of you watching this video have come into adulthood with your baggage weighing on the heavier side, with beliefs that get in the way of your ability to feel good about yourself and the world and with the pain that you've accumulated. As a result, when you meet with life's difficulties, you have a harder time coping. The bags seem to grow as we travel. We just keep picking up more unresolved feelings and new bags are created. Today, our new bags often come as a result of divorce, being passed over for a promotion at work, being arrested, a financial setback, the inability to stop smoking, or the pain that may come with compulsions or addiction. The negative beliefs we have only become heavier and our feelings become more overwhelming. This is a process that takes time, and we don't even realize that it's happening. We learn not to question it. It happens at a rate that is so slow we don't even recognize it. And then one day we simply wake up, and there it is. You know, as some people are material pack rats, we are emotional pack rats. In time, we have developed a tolerance for the pain and are able to maintain that for a period of time. And then through no fault of our own, 
our tolerance lessens and we feel the heaviness. We need help to carry the baggage, so we seek a baggage cart of some sort to help us continue to carry the luggage. Let's take a look at some of our fellow travelers. There's one called addiction. Someone who has dumped all of their beliefs, feelings, and skills into a bottle, a pill, or a syringe. Or it could be an eating disorder. This person dumps their bags into a vat of chocolate, sugars, or starches. Or here we have a cart called depression. All of this person's bags have accumulated into feelings of despair and hopelessness. These carts do make things better for a while. They don't seem to feel the weight as we once did. We are more numb, allowing us just to pile on more baggage. The load gets heavier, and eventually we need a bigger and bigger cart. This is David, and gee, David seems like a pleasant person, and I find him attractive. He has the appearance of success, and David looks like somebody that I like to get to know. Well, at least his wrappings look like somebody that I would like to get to know. David's just gone on a shopping spree. Let's take a look at some of his packages. Oh, here we have some shame. David's feeling shame for being out of control with his alcohol and cocaine use. He thinks he should be able to control it. And then here we have some humiliation because David just spent the weekend in jail. And, oh, look at all of his anger and new anger as well. He's angry with the cop that picked him up. He's angry with his wife for not bailing him out. He's angry with his attorney for not being able to do something, so he had to sit in jail all weekend long. But the labels on his packages aren't really new. Actually, they're really quite old, and evidently he still uses them. And intermixed with all of these bags, you're going to find feelings, beliefs, beliefs that say, I don't need anything from anybody. I'm self-sufficient. You can't trust other people. Throw caution to the wind. But tucked into the bottom, tucked into the bottom of his bag, you find these old, pulsating, discolored resentments. You know, he's still resentful about a promotion that he didn't get 15 years ago. In high school, he wasn't the star athlete. Resentful all these years because his brother makes more money than him. And then what you find inside is going to be shame. Inside his resentment, shame that he isn't good enough. David, David has an awful lot of childhood feelings that he's not worked through. His dad was verbally abusive, and he had a lot of fear that he wasn't adequate enough, and that no matter what he did, he was never going to be able to please his dad. He was frightened of his dad's abuse, never knowing when it was going to come next. He had a lot of fear being with his dad when he was drinking and driving, which evidently was quite frequent. And a lot of sadness, a lot of sadness because his dad didn't show up to his school events. But again, a lot of anger and resentment with his dad for not being a good enough father. And on top of all of this, more beliefs again that say, I am really not okay. I'm insufficient. But David has a tool bag here. This is a bag of skills that he will take with him into his adulthood. And as he started his adulthood, he had the ability to state what he wanted. He had the ability to negotiate so that he would win. He had the ability to put other people at ease. And he was mentally agile. But he lost some of that along the way. He still has some verbal skills. He's been very skilled at manipulating other people. But as you will see, the skills that he has maintained have fueled his addictive thinking. 
While David's unresolved pain and hurtful beliefs by themselves don't cause addiction, they do fuel his need to medicate, to anesthetize, and addiction ultimately becomes the carrier for his luggage. And now I'd like you to meet Sandy. Sandy is a compulsive overeater, and her cart is food addiction. She has a lot of sadness and guilt, and she eats because of her sadness and guilt. And then in time, this guilt grows into self-loathing, and now she eats even more. And look at these beliefs that are so heavy, like cement bricks. Much of her weight is in these beliefs that say, I'm not okay, I'm incapable, I should be punished. I have nothing to offer the world. I'm not important. Other people are more important than me. I'm never going to be happy. And then look at this huge box here of hopelessness that's wrapped with anger, anger at herself and anger at the world. And then guilt, more guilt she will have because of all of this. And she'll have fear and shame boxes that are really, really old. And the strings on her packages are entangled, crusty, and hard to undo. And they're wrapped with more of those negative beliefs that say, it's my fault, and I should have been a better person. Her beliefs and painful feelings will fuel her distorted relationship with food. And then her food addiction simply creates more baggage. And yet, she still carries with her a toolkit. She has some skills, but they're pretty rusty because they're not used much, because her feelings and her beliefs are so heavy and have been sitting on top of these skills. This is Alice, whose cart is depression. All of her bags are very old, but they're sturdy. As devastating as depression is, her bags are still sturdy because she is like many people, what I call the closeted depressed. Many people's picture of depression is somebody who often is very disheveled, who sleeps 18 hours a day, is unable to eat, and maybe even suicidal. Now, while that picture would represent the severe end of the continuum of depression, frequently I have worked with people whose survival skills as a child made them absolute masters at compartmentalizing. Many people raised with loss or trauma, often resulting from being raised in an addictive or abusive family, have spent years as a child saying to the world, I'm doing just fine while dying on the inside. They are what, in my writings, I refer to as the looking good kids. They did what they had to do to survive, and they would learn to compartmentalize their feelings so well that no one else had any idea the depth of the pain that they were experiencing. Today, Alice, she has the ability to perform or function in terms of what is required of her in the workplace. But in her personal life, she feels the depth of pain and great despair. Again, closeted depression. Her bags are sturdy on the outside, but with great hopelessness and helplessness on the inside. Her beliefs, on top of all of her feelings, say, I'm a failure. I can't do anything. I'm inadequate. It's never going to get any better. What's the use? And they're sitting on top of these beliefs that say, suck it up, get on with life, you can handle anything. In Alice's situation, her depression is about unresolved grief and sorrow. There are a lot of different causes of depression. Some people are more genetically predisposed toward it. It could be purely biological. But for so many people like Alice, it has to do with having had much sorrow and sadness in her life and having difficulty coping with all of that. Unresolved grief results from losses that might be an ending of a relationship, a job, a career, or a material object that has great meaning, or it is the loss of hopes or dreams and the loss of significant others, possibly through death. 
Now Alice has had tremendous loss and hasn't known how to work through those losses. And her feelings would simply just accumulate, making matters worse on top of this. Then she has a bag of guilt for feeling this bad. And then you see that she had a very difficult and painful childhood. Her parents were separated when she was young, and she had several step-parents on both sides, and she never felt like she was wanted anywhere. She didn't experience any acceptance at home or at school. She has sadness and shame from her childhood that she's never been able to acknowledge. And in her need to survive, she's pretended that these feelings weren't there. And then more recently, she's had tremendous sadness and sorrow. She lost her only daughter, a 12-year-old daughter, in a car accident. In addition to this heartbreaking sorrow, she's had to deal with guilt, feeling that she should have been there, that she should have been able to do something to save her daughter. And then on top of that, incredible anger with herself and absolute rage at God. These feelings all sitting on top of a toolkit that over time has become very tattered. Alice is a very talented person. She's a talented artist. She's been an avid reader. She knows how to work with her hands and to build things. But as I said, these are skills that she's not used in a very long time, and she's forgotten about them. She still maintains a clean appearance, has the ability to show up at work, and is verbal enough that she isn't questioned. It's very easy to ignore someone such as Alice. The first step in letting go of excess baggage is to get rid of the carts. Without carts, it's impossible for you to carry all of this baggage. So you need to decide what it is that you really want to keep. What do you want to carry with you on this journey? What old feelings and beliefs do you need to let go of? What beliefs would support you in the way that you would like to live your life? What feelings would you prefer to be carrying with you? What do you need to do to make that happen? What tools are you carrying that are useful to keep? Do you have some luggage or a tool bag that you would like to go back and pick up? Do you need to acquire some new tools that you've never had before? With those questions in mind, it's time to continue the journey of life. As you can see, it's not easy to let go. Two of our friends have been willing to look at their bags. They sorted out what they've been carrying. They keep the good stuff and a few of the painful pieces that they haven't been able to let go of yet. David has decided that he can't leave anything. He needs it all, so he goes back and gets his cart to carry it in. That's called relapse. While two of these characters, Sandy and David, have become addicted, let me say again that emotional baggage is not the cause of addiction. Many people have emotional baggage and do not become addicted to alcohol, drugs, or food. For the addicted person, though, it is this baggage that one carries that, if not attended to, will very often lead to a relapse. The willingness to let go is the first step of recovery. To be able to let go of unneeded baggage, it's necessary to challenge the beliefs that you operate from. Are your beliefs hurtful or are they helpful? Do they support the way that you want to live? What are the fears that get in the way of expressing your feelings? Usually they're fears that were based in childhood experiences. It's possible that when you showed your feelings, you were told that you'd better not cry or they'd really give you something to cry about. Or that you have nothing to be angry about and in fact, you should be grateful. Or after you were slapped, that it really didn't hurt. Or maybe simply nobody was there for you in your tears or to help you problem solve your anger. There are many valid reasons as to have decided a long time ago that it wasn't safe to express feelings. 
But today, that fear of feelings is what has many people absolutely immobilized and pushing around out of control carts. Nothing bad has to happen to you as you learn healthy ways in which to express feelings. It's the accumulation of feelings that leads us to trouble. There are safe people and safe places in which to learn to explore feelings, as well as sometimes just recognizing that we're still operating on fears that began 10, 20, or 30 years ago is enough for us to say that we have nothing to base those beliefs on today. As we take more responsibility for our emotional self, as we become more friendly to ourselves with positive beliefs, it's easier to recognize the skills that we've developed along the way or to go in search of picking up a greater variety of skills. As a seasoned traveler, I suggest that you pack lightly. The positive beliefs are lighter, not as heavy as the more negative ones. Allow your skills to be readily accessible and periodically stop and take a look inside and decide what luggage you really need to carry, pick up, or leave behind as you continue your journey. Thank you. Thank you.